Um, well, I've been asked to give a keynote here, and uh, it will not be a keynote about my favorite topic, but about something very, very different. And so these are more or less a couple of thoughts about um, why we have all this centralization and whether we want to have this centralization of our infrastructure, our computer infrastructure in particular. If you have questions, uh, we, we can do an FAQ at the end of the, uh, of the talk. So um, the obvious thing for a talk about these kind of things is um, that I give a brief history. Um, the centralization, yes. In the early days, uh, we had computers, and these computers were custom-built machines. Um, so every computer was different, and there were only a few which have been in large labs. So that is, um, of course, very there is no thing of centralization, decentralization at that point of time because there were simple tools, expensive simple tools, yes. Uh, later it started that the, the industry built real boxes, so in the 1950s, 1960s, but they were all, all different and there was no communication between them, so long, long time ago. And the old standardization of the, uh, of the computer or started with the introduction of the System 360 from IBM in the mid, early mid 60s, um, because this is the first uh, standard for com for computers. Um, you can still run uh, programs within the 60s on on current mainframes. So we have um, there a thing what we have today with the Intel processors. Um, there, there has been a standardization on the 360 on the code side. It evolved ever more, but it's basically still the same. Um, communication was done back then by paper. So you had to write your, your programs on paper and then punch it on cards and transport the cards, the punch cards to the computer, give it to the operator, or send it by snail mail to another uh, computer center. Um, later, they used tapes, and, uh, which made things easier, but it was still no real communication or online communication then. Um, this started with the civil aviation, because the uh, airlines realized that the computers are good for them, and it could uh, uh, improve their business with it. And even more with the run to the moon, so the Gemini and the Apollo project, um, they required that the uh, computers are connected and connected throughout the world because uh, if the satellites are around the Earth, they only, you can only receive them at certain parts so that uh, in Australia, in, in Europe, in the, in the US, on Hawaii, they had their computers and a station and they were all connected. Uh, at that point, we had the first real communication network uh, which was in wide use by one entity back then. And, of course, later, around the end of the 60s, by the airlines. Uh, in the 1970s, things got more interesting um, with the minis. Uh, in the late, late 60s, the uh, digital equipment uh, built a machine called PDP-8, which was the first real mini which, uh, you could use for small groups, so it was achievable to buy this machine and do your computing there. And with these kind of machines, um, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie developed Unix, um, which was well, the start of what we no now know as Linux, as GNOME, which is our foundation, and also the foundation for all kind of communication. Um, the change of the phone systems, they all used uh, systems like, like Unix. So what they used is, they, these, all these man, uh, minis around uh, could communicate with each other using phone lines and later leased lines and they got a standard for this by the end of the 70s uh, which was called or is still called Unix to Unix copy, UCP. Um, so you had a kind of store and forward network. Um, with TCP IP then uh, we got the real interesting stuff because this was online communica communica communication and the sheep micro, so the, the PCs and all these hobby computers and the IBM PC later, um, 
they bring us a lot, lot of more computers there, and they need more communication between them. So we are now in the 80s, and there was a competition between Unix and the mainframes. So um, obviously, the uh, vendors for mainframes wanted their machi machines to be used, um, but there are groups out there who wanted to have an open standard, to have a U Unix system, and that all these Unix systems should interoperate and communicate with each other. Um, this is the term open systems, um, which finally resulted in, in, in POSIX, and we had all of our Europe and in, in the world we had user, Unix user groups, which um, worked to make just one Unix there, because it started it by the end of the 70s that Unix was going very different directions, and uh, that's, that was bad, but somehow we managed, they managed um, that there is a single infrastructure, an operating system and a communication infrastructure, uh, which can be used. Um, so people uh, started to replace their mainframes by clusters of small bo boxes. Um, this was possible because um, they had not only phone lines, but local area networks. Um, so, called Ethernet, and this was in the 80s. So, uh, my first job in the mid or early 80s, uh, they put a, a, a stack, I think it was uh, three IBM PCs and one IBM PC AT uh, on my desk, all connected with a local area network, and I had to write software which worked from uh, with, uh, um, from several workstations, so with file locking, all this, all this stuff. So this was in the 80s, so they um, local air networks were deployed all over the place. Um, at some point, larger machines, mainframes, got back into the companies, and then, then again the small boxes, PCs and Unix and workstations, so it was back and forth. And finally, in the 90s, there was one cut, which was the uh, well invention of the web, which finally um, um, gave the drive to that that this uh, bunch of connected machines is a is a good thing, and the web connected the information together. So before before the web, um, you had to keep a long list of uh, FTP servers and w uh, where you, where you can get your software and your your inf information, and with the web, it was much, much easier to connect this all. So that is, well, 99, uh, 91, 91, I think, so about. And the interesting thing with the web, with the web is that the web is fully decentralized. So as long as you have a uh, permanent internet connection, meaning static IP address, you could run a web server. It was really easy to run a web server, and all these web, web servers, this was a really nice network, or is still a nice network, um, with information linked together. Um, fortunately, the web grew and grew, and you couldn't find any information anymore. So um, there were two companies then, Alta Vista, which was, a, I think it was the first search engine, which helped out there, so the, um, which just searched the entire web for information and linked to the um, single web servers then. And later, of course, Google uh, took over as the prominent search engine. So, uh, this millennium, so I guess so after the dot-com bubble, um, things uh, changed. Meanwhile, the search engines, meaning Google, um, are basically out of the search business. They, of course, you can search there, but that is not really their business, and I have some doubt whether this has ever been their business. Uh, instead, they, what they do today is they profile users and tell this information. And not only the search engines, but there are new players in the game, uh, namely Facebook, um, which does this. Um, so what we have now are central places, a few central places for information. So these are not just the, these former portal sites which linked interesting sites, but you have all the information at one place, namely at Google, at, face, at Facebook. And what they also do is 
that they filter the information. So there is this term of the uh, filter bubble in Google that you get individualized uh, information for you using the same search terms. Um, so it's not possible that you can uh, just say uh, search at Google for this and that because everyone gets, might get a different thing. Um, this can be more easily seen with Twitter. Well, in Twitter and probably also in Facebook, I don't use Facebook, so I have no first-hand knowledge. Uh, you get individual information. There is a bunch of interesting or not interesting stuff, and they filter it for, for you, what you see. So you get an individualized view of the world from Twitter, from Facebook. Um, they also store your data, which is this thing called cloud or other people's machines. And they also uh, allow, you need their approval to access your data or to delete your data. And at their will, they can just delete the, the data or don't allow you anymore to access the data. So this is just, you give your information to some company and do whatever you want with it with this information and you can use it or you can't use it. Um, the thing is that they trick the users into the belief that there is an internet work. And I don't think that we, we, that we have a real internet anymore because these are only a few data centers and all users are connected to the same data centers and they're not connected in a real network. So it's more like this CompuServe thing uh, from the well, 80s, 90s, which was uh, a, single a single mainframe you could connect to using a mod modem. It's basically the same. So they have all control over, over your data. In particular, the web has... Uh, yeah, if you run, if you run, if you go to some website, um, the website will probably run their program on your web browser. So they run JavaScript. It, there are re reasons why you want to have JavaScript. The only plausible reason I know is uh, to delegate, um, uh, um, delegate things like a credit card, uh, um, entering credit card information uh, to, the, uh, um, uh, provide, to the credit card providers. Um, this has the simple reason that uh, you can't afford to pay maybe 10, 20, 20k euros a year for auditing services of your own application. So in this case, JavaScript or some other feature to uh, run um, to run software in your browser is a good idea. In general, I don't think it's a good a good idea. Um, but even worse is that. Uh, you go to some website, example.com, and this uh, example.com also requires that you go to api.google.com, uh, to a bunch of content delivery network, uh, to, a, uh, to a service which provides you a font, and so on and so on. So um, it is often impossible to read uh, web pages. For example, there is, an, um, there is Nitoki, which is a security application or a hardware other thing, you can't read this if you, if you don't have JavaScript in, enabled. So even search engines won't see everything, but you need to enable all these service, services, which is in particular very bad for a security uh, thing, but you see this all over, the <coughs> uh, all over the web. So most time, if I browse something in the web, I just have to tweak my new script plug in to tell, allow, allow, temporary allow, temporary allow this. Um, also offline reading, if you are disconnected from the net, on a train, on an island somewhere and you want to read something, or it's basically not possible uh, for these kind of websites. Uh, further, certificates which we need for HTTPS, uh, used to be stored on the local machine in somewhere below ETC. But meanwhile, they are stored in the browser, and they're updated by the vendors of the browser, which means uh, Mozilla, Google, Apple, and Microsoft. 
um, they just decide what kind of certificates are stored in your browser and what they consider to be a secure website or things. Um, they obviously they phone home all the day. So, and well, I agree. One of the problems they solve with this is um, the failed business model of the uh, of the uh, root CRs, um, which try to sell bits to color your address line nice, like green or yellow, and tell you that it's now secure. And this business model failed because there are too many of them. And so the browser vendors had to do something. But it's all, it's something, they centralize things. So um, the web is still decentralized service, but in practice it's fully centralized because there are only a few things um, which, which you require. Um, so my suggestion is that uh, if you need a JavaScript, host it on your own site and don't use external services like NoScript or API Google.com and so on. Another service is Mail. Mail is, uh, is a cool thing because it's designed as a, for the internet. It's fully decentralized. You can easily set up a mail server and it works nice. You can route around pro problems and, and everything. Uh, it accepts disrupted connections for a couple of hours. I think so, uh, by default, by up to three days. So there's no problem if you just plug it out, you don't have a connection. The, the mail system is really robust. Um, unfortunately, so Marco uh, once wrote a paper about this, um, that most of the mail, meanwhile, goes to very few providers, namely Google. So 50% of all mails are somehow touched by Google. And uh, it's not anymore really centralized. Uh, in, in Germany, we have these uh, only a few providers here from Karlsruhe. And what they partly do is they switch off things which worked in mail for 40, 40 years. And so you can't set up your own mail system anymore. So uh, what I mean is SPF records and this thing, so you can't use an alias file uh, anymore. So what they try to use is to make, to make the mail, mail system more centralized that you have to play uh, how they want it and not how it was designed. Uh, obviously, uh, webmail is um, a strange thing because it's, it's like um, going to the post office to read your love letters or whatever letters you receive uh, only there. Um, well, I think uh, users should, get, should host their mail on their own boxes at home and they should, you should all take control back of your mailbox. Uh, related to GNU PG, uh, there are key servers to store PGP keys. The key servers are a loosely connected network, which is synced. <laughs> Internally, it's, it's really an, an, um, a simple thing which just stores the keys without any other things. Um, there have been tries to move this to a centralized design. There used to be a company here and, um, which ran a thing called keyserver.net and pgp.com also did this for some time, but this, this really failed. Um, there is a new thing of which many people like because it's cool. Um, at least it's cool for those who are using these asocial net networks. Um, what Keybase.io does is just they, they pervert their entire privacy provided by GNUPG by using these privacy invading systems like Facebook and, and so on. And um, that's really strange. Um, more to the point, there are every couple of years there are proposals to, for having a validating key server. That is a key server which uh, sends you an e uh, requires an uh, email confirmation uh, that before you can upload your key to the key server. This does not work, or it will only, would only work if there's one central key server. And so, this is, uh, right now people are again trying to do this, and uh, we should really withstand this idea of centralizing PGP, because PGP has always been a decentralized service. 
on purpose. So there is no hierarchy anywhere. You can just start, write your key, load it up, uh, share keys between users. Very, very easy. And this was a design, design for this. And I think this is a good thing. Uh, similar, there is federation. So mail servers are all, well, today you say feder federated, but there are more and more problems with the mail servers. I already mentioned this. And Jabba, uh, now called XMPP, um, unfortunately lost all track because this protocol is used, but, but only closed and not anymore federated. And only a few, few people are using, uh, still using Jabba. Um, this entire thing has been replaced by centralized sy uh, systems like WhatsApp and also by Signal. They, they, require, they require a central service to work. And yeah, well, I think federation is very important. So really design for it, that you have a lot of servers, machines, applications, which can sync each other and federate. This is a cool design. Um, well, Gnome Conference, this is also about the desktop. And I have mainly some questions. Um, what I believe is that these uh, heavily connected systems are so in our minds, meanwhile, um, that it's hard, hard to replace them. So we are all used to search engines, partly the cloud, I don't know, so we have the apt repositories and so on. We have all these uh, things that just just work behind behind, uh, behind the user that the user does not see what, what really happens. So we have always you always need to be connected. Partly related to the web, which requires which requires this. Um, this is a modern this is a modern world. Um, and the question is whether you can use your uh, laptop, your system still stand alone without this. So if there is a big power outage and a network outage, are you able to still uh, still write something, use your, use your information, use your data and, and do something? Um, even power out outage with a modern laptop, you can uh, just work for a couple of hours. Uh, this just works. Does it, all, does it still work with your systems, with the modern desktops? Can you work with that without an internet connection? That's a question. Uh, another question is, who is in control of the software updates? Um, which is, um, I think it's an uh, interesting uh, attack vector uh, to backdoor, backdoor machines by, uh, by using the update services of all distributions. Are they properly signed? Is, does, does this really work well? There is uh, yesterday, so the uh, uh, German government are raised ideas that, uh, to forbid uh, any kind of encryption or real encryption keys again. Um, that's not really true, but what they really want to do is, um, uh, is to deploy what is called the Federal Trojan software. And uh, it is much easier for them if uh, software updates uh, are not done securely and by trusted entities. Um, so the, the question is whether your, your machine uh, can, be, can be used with an air gap, meaning that you are not network connected, but use an USB stick and to carry the information to another thing. I think this is an easy question. So my machine, this, this works. I can work for hours and hours and hours I don't need any, any, net, uh, any network, uh, which I think is cool. It's not the modern world, but it works even if the service is all disrupted. Well, that's my suggestion. Um, finally, there are also positive signs. Um, despite my negative comments about mail, mail is still a really nice system which works very well. Uh, it's decentralized and it works with disrupted communication. Uh, same for OpenPGP. Uh, not the same with X509 or SMIME because it requires centralized services. There is a system called Briar, the Briar project, um, which is a kind of a, a communication system which does not require the internet, um, but you can sync your boxes just 
um, going to someone and, and bring them over Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. And that's an interesting project, in particular, if the internet has been shut down on purpose, for example. Another thing is GNUnet. GNUnet is an entire infrastructure um, to replace the internet, which uh, is a peer-to-peer -peer network, which is sensor resistant, and it provides a lot of ways to transport the actual information. So you can also do this. You can do this online, of course, using Ethernet. You can do this over mail. In theory, you can also use it uh, by swapping USB sticks. Um, I think these and many other things are interesting things to, uh, to survive a disrupted communication world. So, our summary is um, all the online connections you have are not under your control. That the phone company, there's a phone company which uh, controls the actual wires, there are the service providers, the routing the routing exchange points, and so on. They're not under your control, they're in control from someone else. And you should be prepared for disrupted services. Just because of failures, but also uh, look at Turkey currently, maybe they want to shut down the system, the, 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 the internet, and you should be prepared for this and use classical, uh, be able to use classical methods of uh, uh, conveying information. So, use B sticks properly or, and carrying, carry, uh, using a courier service. Um, yeah, and do not rely on centralized services. That's my suggestion. So, happy gnoming. These are my thoughts. If you have any question about this, or if you have other questions, well, I'm prepared to answer this. Thank you. Hey, thanks for your keynote. Uh, there have been some proposals for replacement protocols for SMTP that, you know, they, if somebody wants to message you for the first time, uh, your mail server can send them uh, a public key that they use the first time. And after that, they do uh, key renegotiation on every message and things like that. Do you have an, an opinion on those? Um, what, what was your question? Do you have an opinion on those? Or yeah, well, um, I didn't mention this. Um, if I'm talking about mail, um, I obviously envision that the current transport, SM, SMTP, SMTP um, is probably not a thing which will survive over the next 20, 30 years, and it could could and should be replaced by something different, but I'm pretty sure that this takes 20 years, at least 15. Um, yes, there needs to do something, but uh, the, the entire in infrastructure is somehow built on mail. Nothing would, would work. You could do any, you can do anything if mail doesn't work anymore, so you need to slowly change this. Uh, one of the problems with mail is the spam problem, which is pretty obvious, and I have no solution to this. Nobody has a solution, um, but um, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't require to have a central services for this, so um, you could also do, um, come up with systems, uh, anti-spam measures, uh, using a client-server model so that the client uh, tells some other service about this and they exchange inf information on wh what might be spam. Uh, I think there is, has not been done enough research because uh, for the large sites, it's very easy to filter out spam because they have so, mu so much information and just can make use of it then.
Here's my question. Let's say you have a family member and they say, I want to use Facebook. I want to use WhatsApp. All the other cool kids are using it. It just works. What do you say to them? <laughs> what I what I say or what what we can't say to this? Well, what should we say? What should we say? Way? Yeah, I I think we we should really point point out the dangers of of, uh, of these services. I think that's the only thing we we can do right now and try to push other systems. But there is no real uh, pace currently for decentralized systems. Uh, I mentioned GNU-NET, but uh, also there are a couple of developers. It's not, not very widely known, and uh, um, they can't trigger the network effect. That And most things can't trigger the network e effect so that it gets really in use. Signal might be a, a, it was an interesting thing because it, just, it, it worked really nice and replaced the old... Uh, Uh, the old systems, non-encrypted systems, um, but it's also central, centralized. It's it's okay. So, but for the purpose it it, it has, I don't know what what to tell. I for uh, my family, we, we have always a problem that uh, we are not connected to uh, what's WhatsApp, and everything runs in in school and in, in other groups. Uh, you don't have WhatsApp. Oh, oh how can we do this? Um, I have no, no real solution for this because everybody uses WhatsApp and it's hard to replace. But yeah, I, I don't know what, what to do. I had I hope that the Snowden effect would have changed something, but this as effect has gone meanwhile. So people know about this, but uh, um, well, that's the state of the world. Okay, go on next. If I want to make a website myself, what uh, should I do or not do in order to ensure that my website does not harm people? So which features should I use? For example, should I, if I want to use Bootstrap, should I use a content delivery network or should I host it on my own, on my server myself? Um, I, I think is that two questions. Um, one thing is, I think you should not use JavaScript, JavaScript or things because uh, the modern C CSS is able to do almost everything you, uh, pe people uh, are currently doing with uh, JavaScript, JavaScript. So it's not, re it's not really required. Um, the other thing, obvi obviously, if you have a very popular website, you need to do something uh, with this. And yes, you can use a content delivery network. That, that I think this is okay. Because this is just a technical measure of the uh, of the of the internet to uh, uh, get information delivered fast. The the problem I uh, I talked about was more about that uh, that websites today are not just single websites. So they they require so many services. If if you look at uh, in, in Mozilla, um, if you look at the network statistic there, you, you can see how how many different servers are accessed just for displaying some, some information. So now I think uh, this is not required. Um, now it's actually three, three comments by the discussion. By now. The first thing is GNOME maps anyone regarding decentralization. Um, the other thing is I'm totally with you running your own mail server. I'm doing that for years now. And let's be honest, this is hard. It, it took me at least one week to set this up and get it going correctly. So I see why people are not, are not doing this and are relying on, on, on central service. Um, the third thing, uh, I totally disagree with you regarding JavaScript. Um, um, okay, I don't use content delivery networks either, I'm with you on that one, but in these days of HTML5 where most functions are actually exposed through a JavaScript API, um, it's like crippling yourself if you're disabling it. So, so this used to work 10 years ago, but I think it doesn't work anymore with the current, with the current web. Um, I mean, we should distinguish between two, uh, two things. There are obviously um, web interfaces which are required which replace uh, desktop software. 
And yes, you need JavaScript there, but that's just a desktop application to me. And the other thing is our website, which uh, provides information. And uh, my comments are m mostly about this. So if, if you want to use the web, web browser as your, uh, instead of GTK, well, okay, then you need this, yeah. There is, a, for example, there's an interesting project which is called MailPile, um, which runs a web browser, uh, where you run your mail in a web browser, but this web mail is on your local machine, so it only uses the, uh, the web browser as you have for displaying the information, and then it's, then it's okay to use this, of course, because it's under your control then. Uh, one point with the JavaScript was also that you should host your JavaScript on your site and don't rely on, on something something else because you don't know whether they change it and your uh, website yeah, breaks them. That's, that's actually fine. Yeah, it's fine, but uh, virtually nobody does this. Oh, well, some large sites do this. But, um, uh, one know. more remark is uh, that uh, some countries uh, just start blocking uh, content delivery networks and blame <laughs> those who use them for the damage caused by, by uh, such blocking. So in Russia, it's now official advice. Do not use content delivery networks. We can block that at any time, period. Okay. Any other questions? Do you want me to answer questions related to my other project? <laughs> okay. I'd just like to get your opinion on services like Pratt & Mail that allow you to, it's very easy to use and allow you to send encrypted uh, stuff and they also store everything encrypted even though it's a uh, centralized yeah, service. yeah, but the problem with, with all this is that the, uh, the provider is, uh, has access to your keys then, or your, to your encrypted mails. So if you can live with this, well, I don't know. Okay, but it's, an, it's not really secure, so I've always been a proponent of end-to-end uh, -end encryption, and uh, this is definitely not end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, I agree that... Uh, um, webmail is uh, inter is very interesting for many for many users, um, but uh, allowing the uh, the web browser to access your keys is very dangerous because it's not only the web browser but it's the uh, the site the the webmail provider which has access to your keys, but they can just simply simply replace uh, their current code at at any time, so you, uh, anyway, you download this, and uh, this is dangerous because um, they might be forced to do this. For I talked about the federal, federal Trojan software in, in Germany. Do we know whether they are, will be will be forced to uh, uh, send you malware then? Um, webmail is webmail, and uh, secu secure use of webmail is really a problem. But there, is, uh, there are some developments which are going in a good direction currently. Just to complete the answer, at Tails we have a small application that lets the user enter their, their message and encrypt it in the local machine and then you, they, it puts it on the clipboard and you can paste it on your webmail. And that's far from ideal in terms of user experience, but it allows people that actually, for some reason, are used to webmail and will not change soonish to write encrypted email in an end-to-end -end encrypted way. I, I agree with you that these simple solutions are of, uh, often the best solution because they are easy to explain. Uh, as far as 
the fundamental problem of webmail. Does it help things if there is proper sandboxing of browser processes so that your webmail uh, DOM is isolated from what's in other windows or is that not really make things better? Is that still exposing to too many other pieces of the browser code? Yeah, it, it depends on what, what you want. So the browser code is, well, I, I wouldn't trust the these internal things in the browser. So um, we have a proposal uh, to use, uh, um, or GPG has, has, has a feature which is called a web browser socket. So you, um, you could, in theory, uh, we're trying to get the Mailvelope uh, developers um, to make use of this. Um, so they could just uh, use Mailvelope, but all the private, private key, and the private keys are used outside of the browser. But this has the the other problem is of course that you need to deploy the the entire software. It's not just uh, just open your web browser and do and it works on all tablets on all, on all software without installing anything because there is a browser there, and that's that's a that's a problem. So the the infrastructure is is still missing and how to deploy this to everyone that that's a, that's a real problem, and that that the user needs to do this or the vendor of the machine needs to install the software first. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you, Werner. Thank you.